Zoom. We are here to affirm one another. We are here to teach and to share. This is why I'm about to call this next generation of women. I've been waiting for this. Because I'm about to be taught the people. Yeah. So we're talking about two generations of women here. And sometimes when we talk about feminists, people think that it's a new age situation. But I want you to look up a woman called Phyllis Dandala. A lot of you will know her, but most of you will know A.C. Jordan more than they know Phyllis Ndanda. That's a question right there. It, it, that's a question right there. Umama gaga gam gaga doctor upalo upalo the very progressive the very progressive minister of arts and culture that we had in our first democracy and you can see whose child he was. And the the women who I'm about to call next are here to affirm that kind of history and to talk to that kind of, of um, memory and to instill that kind of narrative. The topic we're about to talk to is women of letters. Ellen Kuzwayo. Yes. Loretta Nwobo. Yes. Noni Chabavu. <coughs> Miriam Kadi. And Phyllis Ndangala. And if we don't have the women whom I'm about to call up, um, you know, they can actually come up as I introduce them. Susko Sitlava, one of my favorite writers. People want fiction writer. He has contributed so much to the poetry of South Africa. These hands in the tongues of their mothers, queer Africa, Dibala, Ntoni, Nantoni, Nantoni. This is Pumla, Ola. Who is the friend of the student? What is slavery to me? I know that you, you've read Ray, South African Nightmare. Please go back also and read what is slavery to me because these are connected. Usis mm -hmm. um, Kosi is also doing a beautiful collection of basically the history of South African women who've written poetry for the past 20 years, mm -hmm. just bringing it out to the fore. And we're bringing it out in um, So thank you for that, for that opportunity that we can talk to ourselves, and we can affirm ourselves, and we can learn about the history that has been so hidden. And last but not least, she's new in town, so I need a little bit of build up. Barbara Boston. Barbara is coming from, from UCT, and um, she's now a job beggar. <laughs> She's also another sister who is writing about the stories of the literature and the stories of black women, of South African women writers, people we don't know and people that we are about to know. And they've written so much and they have thoughts about, why am I sitting, why am I standing like that? It's wrong. Like, what happened? Why are you fighting? What, like, you know, who sit next to the people? Sit next to the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, this is not fair. Yes, you're like the silent one. Yo, Bonte. My apologies. Carabo. Very seldom do we have sign language interpreters. The real one, the ones who, who tell. <laughs> Like, even if you look it up on Google, it will be the truth, I promise you. Can I have a right? Yeah, we don't do that stuff. Next. Karamo, I've been watching you all day, and you're actually going to make us learn sign language because you do it like so, so well. This is why 
you know, the kind of things that you do, because nobody else does them and they're there. It's okay, but I could learn that, you know. So, yes, welcome. Now, why are you not interpreting? Hello, what's wrong with you? <laughs> really. Tonight, we're going to have a conversation. It's going to be open to all of us. Let's talk about these women because they are, we here are a continuation of what they started. And they are proof and demonstration that feminists and feminist thought and journalism and black women who were journalists were there. Where were these people living? It does the township, you know? And when you think about these women who were in exile, or, or rather people who were in exile, you're thinking of men. You never think about the, the women. When you think about writers who were writing in town, thinking Miriam Hardy, she was, the narrative was ours. And we choose to overlook some of these narratives, these stories that were being told, but they be, they be told by women. And I really would like to, to, to start there and say that the kind of stories that this, this, this woman was writing, working in, 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 in a shop, Yamajuda, in where is she now? How is this woman contributing to our lives? Now, how are we contributing to our writing now? Um, over to you, Professor Puna. Did you know? Um, I don't. You have to switch it on. It is on. It says on. It's green. I'll, I'll give you mine. And it's not I think I pray. Mine. Oh, yes. <laughs> this happened yesterday too. Um, someone. Um, Miriam Badi is the only one of the writers we're talking about who is still alive. Who still has a home in Soweto. Which is a home that she's had for her entire adult life. Um, she still lives in that home. It's still her home. Um, although she is in care now. Um, so she is a Joe Burger. And she's a Soweto. Yes. And she grew up in Lesotho. And I am struck by how significantly her life and her life's work and her writing and the spirit of generosity to other writers continues to resonate with some of our best thinking and most imaginative work today. So I'm a little sad, and I'm sure as Barbara is, we saw her, we went to visit her um, two, two, three, two, two, weeks ago? two weeks ago, that um, that she's not able to be here. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, sorry, I, I was opening a conversation for us to talk about how, how was she Okay. How has she contributed to us? Like yeah. African Atlanta. How has she contributed to our land and how are we contributing to that? I'm not sure. Generational conversation. And what are we doing with her work? Are we doing anything? Are we doing enough? Well, no, I don't think we're doing enough with her work. I think very few, few of us continue to work on her, on her, on her work. Barbara, I mean, she's one of the women that Barbara wrote her PhD on. Yeah, Barbara's PhD um, was on black women writers. It was on, on, on William Sidey, on, 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 on Robert and Michael, and and Cindy oh my God. Um, how has she contributed to our lives? I mean, I think that if we go back, I think if we go back and we reread um, Miriam Badi, many of his of, of, of whose works are out of print, in fact, we begin to see a really sophisticated and deep and important and nourishing and radicalizing sense of what a black feminism that takes sex, violence, power, movement, 
freedom, imagination, self-love, seriously. And I think we often think these are new things. And I think we can continue to think these are new things for as long as we're not reading. Um, and so I think that the contribution that she should be making um, is significant. I think that very often what we, I mean, I think she's slightly out of view because so few of us work on her, um, at least in South Africa. Um, but I think that you know we cannot think about the history and the manifestations of feminism and of black feminism in this country without really looking at the work of Miriam Clyde. Whether you're looking at her novels, um, whether you're looking at, 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 at the story of the two versions of her first novel, um, New Relative Metropolitan, the title she hates, the version she dislikes, but she, that she allowed to be published because she was so afraid her mother was going to die before her first book was published. Yeah. Or Between Two Worlds, the title she gave it and the full version that eventually got published by Longman and became a Longman classic. Um, whether we're looking at Footprints in the Quark or one of the archetypal novels of the 1976 generation, um, Amanda, Only Sota, which is almost impossible to find, even in out of print, out of, I think Barbara is one of, Barbara is one of maybe, I don't know, a handful of people who still have How is this though? How is it that we struggle to find, to find these books? This is about Rudolph uh, Ichabar. You, you once asked me years ago to see if I could find a copy in the Indisa Library. I went to there of Lodi Jabavu's work. This is one of the biggest libraries on the African continent. And, and you know, I'm bringing, it, I'm bringing the question to you to, to also talk to us about the work. How's it? <laughs> She's a panelist, by the way, and she just made the magic of giving us water. Thank you. Multitasking. <laughs> so, she's talking about the death of the presence of the, these women's work. And I'm alluding to Uloni Jababu. Couldn't find her. You're passionate. You're doing, you, you, you're bringing her back into, into our lives, into our narratives. Please take us through that. And tell the people who Loni Jabavu is, because some of the people don't know who Loni Jabavu is. Somebody might think we're talking about Loni Gasa. No. <laughs> we are not talking about Loni Gasa. Yes, Maga? Yes. Cool. So, it's green. It's green. So it's on. Um, before I even say anything, by the way, at UNISA, where you couldn't find her book, uh, is a collection of her father's papers. Everything that, everything that her father, you know, had, including receipts and bank statements and all of that. Just a personal collection that was grabbed by UNISA upon his death in 1959. So um, I'm holding this book because I need people to see it. It was around July of 2001 when I accompanied an American colleague, because at that time I was working in an international NGO, who wanted to just get some South African books. I said, oh, I'll help you. So she said, oh, I don't use a lot of money buying books. I said, fine, I'll take you to a second-hand bookstore. So I took her to Melville, the second-hand bookstore, because it's one of my favorite second-hand bookstores. So I suggested a lot of books, and she was paying. It was a bookstore that I often go to. I used to go to quite a lot. So when she was paying, I looked at the book, I thought, what's new? And there was the spine. I thought, no need Jababu, no need Jababu. I'm a reader, who is she? And I read the back. I thought, I hate this. How can I not know about a black South African woman? So I bought the book and I read it. And so to come to the question of what, how, what has she contributed to our lives, I read the book and for the first time ever, I could imagine my parents' lives. I don't know if you know what I mean. You know, you know how your parents are just your parents? 
they're doing the job of being a parent. You can't imagine them as younger people. You can't imagine who their connections were. Yeah, so I thought, wow, I can see my parents. Now, Noni was born in 1919, and my, both my parents were born in 1929. So there was a very special connection. I could be in their time through this book. This being a book, a memoir, she tells the story of growing up in the Eastern Cape, and it's a story that she started writing in 1955 when her brother, who was a student, a medical student at Wits University, died, and she came for the funeral. So she came for the funeral, stayed on, visited family in, in, the, in the then Transvaal, visited her sister, who was married to a Ugandan man in Uganda, and then after that, people were saying, but you must write about this, you must write about this, because guess where she was? She was in the UK, and she had been there since she was 13 years old. So who is Noni Jabavu? When I started doing my work on her, and I googled her, not a single thing came up on her. But the things that came up were on her father, a man called Don, Donald, Donaldson Dengo Jabavu, DDT, and another man's name came up, which is John Dango Jababu, and that's her grandfather. What do we know John Dango Jababu for? He was called JT. He started the newspaper Izimbo Zabansundu in 1884. He was the editor. And what do we know about DDT? It's that he was one of the two first lecturers at Forte University in 1916 when it opened. Okay? And then DDT married a woman called Tandiswa. Tandiswa, and the surname is, um, oh, it's gonna come to me right now, uh, Makiwan. Now, what we know about Tandiswa's father is that he was the Reverend Makiwan and that a lot of people talked about. But Tandiswa was the daughter, so Tandiswa started dating DDT, and then they had four children. Well, the first child was a daughter who died just after Noni was born. And then it was Noni, her sister, and the brother who died in Johannesburg. So what the parents decided, because they'd had such a challenge with the education of DDT, because the, univer the universities were not allowing dead people then, is to just send Noni off straight after, you know, straight after, she was still in high school, straight after, what was the lower level then? So she went. Now, where did she go? She went to a high school in York, in the north, that was for girls only and was run by the Quakers. Um, the Quakers being a very, I hadn't heard about them until I started doing this work. They had a very particular way of looking at religion. So to cut a short story, long story short, she goes to this, universe, to this high school, it's girls only, she's the first black person that I've ever seen. She's fostered, she lives with parents who are white, who are friends of the DDTs, but who are also friends of Jan Smuts, the then general in South Africa, I don't know. So when she goes to university, the World War breaks up, this is 1939, because she left in 1933. So she can't really come home, and we know what happened to women during the wars, right? They started being recruited into the war, of war effort, and that's what she did. Meet somebody, has a child with them, meet some, and, and the person died, he was from the Caribbean. Meet somebody else, marries them, divorces them, meet somebody else, marries them, and then goes to uh, and, uh, and then in 1955, when her brother dies, writes the book. So the book, she starts writing it in 59, 55, it comes out in 1960. Now, what's significant for me about that is that when I started doing the work, everybody who was writing anything about the first black writers in this country I was talking about Abrahams, and uh, it was even before. I mean, Peggy, earlier on, Peggy was just a journalist, you know? That's the way they talked about him. When they talked about people who were writing novels, it was, uh, what's his first name? Abrahams. My boy, Peter Abrahams. 
and um, down Second Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Peter Abrahams wrote his first book in 1954, Pahele in 1959, and Noni in 1960. And it was impossible to find anybody who would mention that consistently. 1963, she comes out with a sequel to that book called The Orca People. Again, a story about the Eastern Cape. But also she does very interesting things. So I'm going to stop right here when I finish this. She writes two memoirs. She becomes an editor of a very prominent literary magazine called The Strand in the UK. She becomes the first woman, the first person who was not from that country, the first black person to do that for that well-renowned literary magazine. When she's in South Africa in 1997, in 1977, she writes for the Daily uh, Dispatch. So she's a columnist. She's an editor, she writes memoirs, she wrote uh, a novel that never got published, she wrote some plays that never got published, she started writing a father's biography that never went far away, but I have a sense from some of her writings that maybe it's in Italy, in somebody's drawn, because her book was also published, was also translated into Italian. So she became, at least for me, as I'm busy finding this out, a very, very significant writer that we can learn from as this, that, or that other generation because of her passion for writing. And when you read about how she writes, how she, the way she wrote about how she was writing, for me, is just fascinating because earlier on, she was also writing reviews for, of music in the magazines in the UK because at that time she was married to somebody whose claim to fame was having introduced, listen, to introduce Calypso into the UK. That's how they gave him the signature. But anyhow, at that time, that's, what, that's the kind of writing she was doing. So the short, version to the short version answer to that question is, I am fascinated by her writing from those many perspectives. And I think there's a lot to learn from that. And she's one of our own. And I'm going to ask two people, not now, but I want you to think about it. I'm going to ask two people in this audience, what is the significance of all of this? Why are these three women sitting here? Why are they thinking the things that they're thinking about the people who've come before us, particularly these women? Think about it. Two people, I'd like to get a, a, an answer. What is the significance of all of this? And I'd like to I'd like to get into the issue of publishing, but right not right now, because it's come out from what you were saying that the long man who, who published and she wanted to publish it quickly, she couldn't think about and she couldn't own the, the, the issue about about the name of the naming of her book because it, it seemed like the book would slip out, right? And you also mentioned the, the issue of, of publishing. Um, so it is, it is also significant then, like it is significant right now. But before we go there, I would like to ask uh, Barbara, you thought we forgot about you. <laughs> we don't forget. We dig you up. So, Barbara, last year, in 2015, Uma passes on. I hope we have something of hers, or at least enough, to share. Because I hear she loved children. She was a teacher. She, she, she was a feminist. And there's so many ways of being a feminist, right? Um, talk to us about her. You wrote your PhD on her, woman, right? And, and you know those PhD documents, it's like 359 million pages. Share a little bit. It's you. You, you broke the microphones. 
Yeah, you, you cannot be put in your place. This is why you're breaking the microphones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, Tando, and thank you for your vision. This has been very healing politically and personally. I think this day, just what I've seen today, has been really wonderful. And, and Natalia, thank you for your question about Nobo. Uh, she, uh, when I think about her, I was think I'm so immersed in her work that I was trying to get a, a sense of distance. And I jotted down three things which, when I think about her work, um, comes to mind for me and could possibly be said of all of the writers that we're discussing today. That first of all, she used writing as a practice of freedom. Um, this was a woman, an African woman, um, who was a teacher, who grew up in rural uh, KwaZulu-Natal, who moved to Durban and went into exile in 1962 or 63. Um, but her, for her, writing was the practice of freedom. So even though she wasn't politically free, she found ways to discursively, to in discourse, in writing, create a sense of freedom for herself. And um, uh, Mom Loretta was a person who gave a lot of interviews. She was very aware of um, making history, her role in history. She was one of the first African women, South African African, to publish a novel in English in 1981, Cross of Gold. Um, and her second novel is the most well-known one, um, And They Didn't Die, which is actually, I want to think, what is a feminist word for masterpiece? I haven't, um, I want to come up with a new word, but it's just a brilliant um, political novel, which is extremely feminist, which um, locates African women who are in the Bantustans and um, theorizes and brings to light their oppression, but also the kinds of activism and resistances that they practiced in relation to apartheid. Um, and the third thing that she, that is special about her, I think, as a writer, and that is special about this particular group of women is that they were writing in and for a community. Um, so, Loretta Mwobo not only wrote novels, but she was also an arts activist, and she was an activist who enabled other black women to write. And her legacy is still there for us today. The, um, she has left signposts, and so has Mariam Tladi, um, and I'm, I'm not too familiar with Jababu's work, but there are signposts for, for women who want to become creative agents, who want to become creative writers, and who perhaps are not finding the role models. I mean, any, I think for this generation that's not true anymore. But she, she very self-consciously wrote about her processes of writing, um, as you say Noni Jababu did also. So one of, she wrote two collections, and one of it was Let It Be Told, which she published in 1987 in exile and it's about the conditions that black women writers in Britain and in the African diaspora face and in that when you look at that collection so her fiction is remarkable in what it does um, but in the community of black women writers that she built and empowered and enabled is also quite remarkable she wrote the foreword to Mariam Tladi Soweto stories um, we see also Bessie Head writing the foreword to Ellen Kuzwayo's um, Call Me Woman. So they, they were in community with each other and they, they enabled each other and they had a sisterhood and they helped each other. And when you look at the introduction to Let It Be Told, the collection of black women's narratives around how they became writers, which was published in 1987, um, what she does there, and she's not really known for this, is that she's also a, a literary critic. She could have been um, an academic at a top institution had she chosen that part in order to do her work there, but she didn't choose that. She chose um, different routes of doing her work and enabling women. Um, but but her, her writing in that is, is a remarkable work of history, of historicizing black women's writing and of creating a history of black women's writing where women 
black women in the diaspora, in South Africa especially, given that they were battling at the time apartheid and then 300 years of colonialism, were completely written out of history. And what um, Noah did was, through her writing, she rewrote, and Miriam Tlali also does this, um, women, black women, African women, who were objectified, who, was, who were written as objects. Um, if you think about how uh, the, the novel, Alan Payton, for example, his description of an African woman, Maku Malo, right? She's silent and mute with the suffering of oxen. Yeah. You know, the women are described as animals, really. They are likened um, to that. And, and, and what Norma does is she, re she claims and reclaims subjectivity. She makes black women into persons. She creates personhood for them when none existed. So I think, um, I like to think about her contribution not only as an artist, and as a very astute artist who was aware of history, but also as a woman who enabled feminist circles of writing and enabled other women to write. She gave a lot. In her later years, she came back to South Africa. Um, she went, she lived in Durban. Um, after she came back from exile in 1994, um, she became an MEC for Arts and Culture and then I think also an NEC for education in the KwaZulu-Natal legislature. So, um, and I interviewed her, I visited her, she was extremely generous to me. I arrived at her home, not having a hotel in Durban, not knowing anyone in Durban, and when she found this, first of all, she made me lunch, and then when she found out, she said, where are you going now? And I said, well, I don't really know, I'm going to find a hotel. And she said, well, you're not going to find a hotel, you're going to sleep here tonight and tomorrow I will put you in a taxi back to the airport. So, so and, and I've spoken to countless women who have interviewed her like that. She allowed us into her home and into her space and was extremely generous and kind. And even as we were researching her experiences, she was enabling us. So the questions that she asked were multidirectional. What are you doing? What are you gonna do with your PhD? You know, so, so always, always in that way, she was an activist who was enabling other women. And that's, a feminism can be found in her books as theory, but also um, in her practice and in the way that she interacted with other women. So, uh, did you see the, the pride in her eyes when she said, and I interviewed her? It just, it just filled her with so much pride. Why not? And how many other women are out there uh, that we can do our masters and our PhDs in history, in arts, in journalism? Think about it. These women have been there. Uh, we just need to find them because the system has put their power beneath that knee and that thumb of oppression, right? And this is just reference and demonstration. But now, Suskosi, what do we do with that work that is unpublished? There were plays, uh, and, and I would like, to, you know, all of all, the two of you also, Sis Pumla and, and Sis Barbara, to, to, to speak about that as well. There's so much work. Even the people we're not talking about. I'm thinking, Ellen Kuzwayo, we're leaving her out because I see the young people know who she is. Because she's the one who was more on the recent. Uh, we all know her books. She was more vocal. We saw her on TV. But that time when there was no TV and interviews that we could have reference to, uh, her plays, uh, that were not published, Her other, the, the, the other works that are not published, the, the struggle that they had with regards to just compete with it. You're competing with white people, you're competing with men, you're competing with, the, you know, like with, with the next pretty girl because, you know, you're not interested in being pretty. You're interested in the work, right? Uh, so you know you 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 
you competed with so much. And at that time, I can just imagine the kind of system that you had to struggle against, right? <laughs> to get that work out. So, so can you speak to that? To what do we do? What do we do with the work? To get the unpublished work. To, to, to yeah. get the work out there. What can be done, rather, is, is, is the question. What can we done? And you're speaking to all of us. What I'm doing right now is to dig and dig and dig. And I follow whatever lead there is until I hit a wall. And I've hit so many walls. <laughs> And the reason I've hit so many walls with her is because uh, she was out of South Africa for 63 years. She left at 13, came back in her 80s. And she wasn't in just one country, she was in many countries. Though she was prominent as a writer, she was on the periphery. Though she was connected to high-powered people, like when she lived in Kenya, her father had been friends with Jomo Kenyatta, she was just a woman from South Africa to many other people, though she was on first-person terms with Jomo Kenyatta. So for me, the idea is to dig and dig and dig. Let me give you an experience when I was in Kenya, and I finally found the Standard newspaper in their offices, and I said, could you take me to your archive? I know that she was writing for the Standard when she was in Kenya. And then they took me to this room, that had newspapers from the floor to the ceiling, from like from here to here, floor to ceiling, just newspaper on top of another and another and another, nothing, no label, nothing, and they said, this is the standard newspaper. And I said, she was here from 1967 to 19, they said, well, you want to look? <laughs> so I left. Uh, there is a letter that she wrote to somebody when she was living in Zimbabwe in a frail care center and she said she's giving up now, she's going to burn everything that she's ever written because it's never going to be published. Now, do I know if she did burn it? She wrote about the intention to burn it. Do we know what is, was in the pile that she was intending to burn? I don't know. Why do I, why, what do I know about her father, the work on her father? In another letter to somebody else that I dug and found somewhere, she talks about having sent the manuscript to somebody who was based in Italy at that time. So, we dig until we find what we can find and we tell the stories we'd like to tell. My project is a biography project on her, and I'd just like to tell her story because I think it's, in a sense, it's quite an unusual story in the sense that, I mean, how many South Africans were leaving in 1933 to become the coconuts of that time because that's the other <laughs> problem she encountered when she, each time she came to South Africa, ooh, what kind of accent do you have just because you live in the UK, you're married to a white man? So she also had to deal with all those issues, and so she's interesting for me from that perspective. So I think we dig, and we do what fascinates us, what we have the passion for. I started working on this in 2004, it's been 12 years, it's still not done, and I'm not giving up. Yeah. Yes. work to undo the, the injustices. The, how do you undo 500 years? <laughs> exactly what you just said. That's how we undo it. Barbara? Oh, Sis Pobla, why did you think I was going to ask you first? I didn't. Barbara gave me the mic and I took oh. it. <laughs> well, give it back to her. <laughs> Thank you. Give it back. <laughs> so yes, uh, did you find other work that is not published by Uu Maklobo? And what can we do? And this I'm saying in a general sense about all these manuscripts, because I can imagine that there's other women out there. So, okay, I'm going to crisscross all over the place now. 
Uh, but with um, Loretta Norville, her work, she made sure that her work got published. I don't know if there are manuscripts that are hidden or that got lost, but she was very, very intentional about getting her work out and having it seen in the light of day. Her last uh, collection, edited collection, was called Prodigal Daughters, published in 2012. Um, and this was a collection of essays, including her own experience of women's experiences in exile. Um, so one thing that we can do and we do do is teach. So we, here we have people who teach. But the other thing, so if there's anyone in the audience who owns or runs a press, these books are out of print and they are necessary. They are so needed in our country today. I think with the movement that started last year in 2015 with Roads Must Fall, there's, a, there's been a very definitive shift to decolonization, decolonizing our curricula, decolonizing the humanities is a big debate we're hearing about um, in the universities but also in the schools. So I think um, at the university where I studied in the US, that we used to have a first year book. So every first year student that comes onto campus had to read this book. And one year, a very good book, for example, was The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, it's, it's quite a well-known book about this black woman whose body was used for DNA, like harvested. And I think that's, that there are books that need to be republished. And three of them, which are urgent, and, and Kosti is going to disagree with me, but Maria Tlady's um, Between Two Worlds, is again out of print the, for the third or fourth or fifth time. Loretta and Morbo's um, And They Didn't Die, I think is a, is a seminal, seminal text that every child in high school in South Africa should read. And then Amandla is a novel which you cannot almost find anywhere. Um, I found my copy on eBay and bid a lot of money for it because I really, really wanted it. But, but um, in the States, but, but these, these books need to come back into print. I don't think it's that difficult to do that. I think with the, the way in which politically we have moved in the past two years, there's definitely a market for it. So Oxford University Press, for example, I just saw, and I don't know how long this has been out, um, Zex Mdaz, The Madonna of Excelsior, been published many times, but OUP has brought out a version which is, which is quite, inexpensive relatively. I think a publisher needs to pick up, please, anybody in the audience who has this connection and who has the resources, we need to republish these works. And we need to have, I think, Amandla, for example, um, is about the 1976 uprising and how women organized within it. And I think a lot of the things that women um, within student movements are facing um, are, are addressed in that novel that was written post-76. And so there's a lot of learning that we've forgotten that we don't even know we have. There's a trove of knowledge um, that if we could just have these books accessible, people could, could, could access. And then with Tladi, there are manuscripts that are missing, and people and are trying to locate one. So maybe you can say more about that. Ah, uh, don't, don't be like <laughs> Can I jump in, Natalia? Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I think All that what's what. striking for me is, is just in terms of the archive of black South African women's writing, is how <coughs> even the most visible at some point, even the most successful, even the most comfortable in terms of class and having famous families and so on, right? Even the ones who get, who got published, historically got published, like Jabavu, like Tladi, like Mobo, like um, Mashinini, like Kuzwayo, and so on, right? At some point, these texts are there, they're available, they're circulating highly, they're highly um, read, they're highly referenced, they're passed around, they study, people write, you know, various things on them throughout the world, there's scholarship on them. And I think often the mistake that we make and what is instructive about about black women's writing um, in, 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 in South Africa and Southern Africa is the way in which even the most visible, the most iconic, the most celebrated writing at some point can disappear from view, right? And so it is incredibly 
bizarre and saddening for me often because when you know when, when, when Barbara and I were at university and, and as people who who have multiple degrees in literature and who and, and you know who did <laughs> stuff that we did um, many of the black women's work we write and teach on are, are, are I, I had I had finished almost my second literature degree before I stumbled upon Miriam Clyde. I was reading something on black British feminism living in Britain when I discovered Laura Tanjombo's work on black women's writing and black women's publishing. Um, um, you know, I, I, I had finished all of that. I was, I, was, I, was, you know, I was back, I was doing my first kind of, again, literature job when I discovered with absolute relish and joy and, 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 and fear almost, Noni Chabavu's The Oka People. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the house that I grew up in is 15 minutes away from the house that she grew up in. And, 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 and just reading her and saying, oh my gosh, she's talking about my hometown, yeah. right? And it's that, oh my God, okay. And of course, I mean, the, the geography had changed and, uh, and things seemed more. <laughs> I was, this was, you know, as an upper day child. So she was, she was writing of a more hopeful um, kind of black presence in the world. Um, so that's the one thing I think is important. That, 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 that it's important to remember that we have this archive, right? That we're not the first ones to do some of this work. But it's also important as part of trying to find again, to circulate again, to reflect to think about what that legacy bestows on us, to also think about the processes through which these women disappear from view. Mm. And how it is that they do at all, but also why it is consistently they that disappear. That's the first thing that's yeah. instructive to me, so, right? So many of their peers continue to circulate. Although in Miriam's like this case, this is a lot less so because the black consciousness writers who are her peers are like Zamani or Sirote or, you know, they, or, 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 or maybe with the exception of Van Veik. But in, in, in the main, they're not, you know, they, they, there is scholarship, there continues to be scholarship, but I wouldn't say, I don't, I'm not convinced that Clyde is necessarily less visible than many of, so there's something weird about her generation, right? There's something very strange about reception and circulation and survival of the black consciousness era of South African writers, which is interesting also because it's the biggest, it is, until, until now, it is the biggest explosion of black literary output until 10, 15 years ago. And yet it is really the era in which almost all the writers kind of fade from view. Um, so I think that, that there's additional things to think about about, 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 about about that. But I think also to link to what Barbara was saying about one of the things that have been incredibly valuable for me as, a, as an African feminist in the world who lives in Southern Africa is the thread in how these women writers and some of them feminist writers also choose to inhabit a radical politics about it that it is also about extreme generosity, right? So when Barbara is talking about how Nobo not only is involved in South Africa but also in Britain and, and, and I've seen some of this work too, um, is working on initiatives that are reflecting around the conditions that enable that that that, that that dissuade and, and, and how to enable black women to write and to intervene in publishing very differently. She does a lot of work with, with Beryl Gilroy, who's a very similar character to her, but from a different part of the world, from the Caribbean. Or when you look at how much time Miriam Zadi spends interviewing other women while she's writing in staff writer, she's the most prolific writer of that of, of the of the staff writer generation. She, she has an essay in almost every staff writer for the first 10 years. And she's and, and, and very often, she's, she's deeply concerned about how to talk, talking to other women writers, talking about why you're not seeing as many black women writers in this generation, talking about how black women, you know, she, also, she, has, she has this interview, she has this essay. Um, and so there's kind of very deep concern, not only in how they write and imagine, 
but also in, 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 in shifting the ways in which, in which, and sharing space, and sometimes, you know, kind of enabling many other women writers to get, to, 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 to get published. And so I think, you know, this, this aspect of, of not just representation and how important that is in, in, in the imaginative product, but also the ways in which the specific orientation to, to, to other writers, to other women writers, um, and, 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 and I think in Miriam's like this kid, or even in Ellen Kuzwayo, I mean, Ellen Kuzwayo's um, biography, Call Me Woman, performs this generosity in a different way. So she's keenly aware of how black women disappear from you. So she, you know, the, 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 first, the first few editions of that collection, sorry, of that, of that, of that, of that biography, of that other biography, have lists of black women doctors, black women, men, it, Technically, this has nothing to do with her biography, but she can see very clearly how it has every how how a record of black women's um, boundary breaking has everything to do with writing a narrative of how of of, of, of you know of, of, of her own activism as 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 as, as, a, as a as a as a black South African woman. And I think also one of the things that we've lost. I mean, we have an enormous archive for a long time. Many 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 black women activists wrote their biographies other biographies in this country. So I think, I suppose, it's, 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 for me, it's a lot less about, I mean, I think being published is important, obviously. But I think that we also, at a time, like Barbara says, where we're able to ask slightly different kinds of questions of ourselves about, about the relationship between, between, between women and writing and publishing, right? And, about, and, and, and I think one of those conversations has to be about about how do we, what do we know about how women writers and their works and their ideas disappear from you? And, 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 and how can we use what we know, if we know anything at all, and how do we know something? How can we use what we're starting to know so that we're not sitting here, well, so that you're not sitting here, and Barbara and Kosi and I are old, saying, where are well, they? How do we find those people that they talked about? Who are those people that they talked about at about one? And to realize, to realize how much there is to say, to realize that we are out of time, like that, that, that. But there's still so much to be said. So I'm going to give like one minute, 30 seconds, but I can give you grace of one minute to say your parting shots because it doesn't even look like we're going to have a discussion or even questions. So. We can, yeah, okay, so I'll take two questions or comments, very clear, very brief, very brief, no, eh, 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 please. Um, but I do, what, should I take the questions and then, Cisco, so you wanted to say, take your 30 seconds, say your parting shots. I, who's, who's chairing this panel? Okay, it's fine, I'll listen to you. Um, there's a head over there. There's another head. I I can only take three. I I apologize. No. Okay. Switch the microphone on. And please do speak to your librarians. Push them to have some of this work and go into your wikis and update and re these are open access update and review and put <laughs> these people's work in there now her mic is working so i'm answering your question and natalia you said you're going to ask two people to say why is it important for these elders when i thought we had time but yeah, yeah. but I, I think we said we can ask a question so yeah. i'm answering your question okay uh, uh, and I'm answering it in two ways, to say we're doing that because even from the discussion you can see that there's a body of work out there, some of it maybe it has disappeared, but a lot of it could be found if there's enough time to do that. We, where we can start un unpacking that very same question, Professor, you're saying why they disappear and how much more can we learn about them as well in terms of what happened. So it's important to do that now. There's, I think there's no time uh, later than now, because if we, we lost whatever we had in terms of the past, today is the beginning of that time. But on the second part of it, it's important because as elders, you need to start teaching us to start 
preserving your, your own history and your own legacy. Because if you don't do it, 30 years later, some of you will be gone. We are going to go at some point, 50 years later, 100 years later. And we will not have a generation that will be taking care of your work. So it is important for that reason for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there is another one. There's, there's two. There's two there. No, no, no. no. Okay. Um. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. A very brief one. Yeah, very, very brief. Yes. Uh, along the same line, in the same vein, it is an important work of excavation that you're doing uh, in order to preserve uh, something that otherwise would uh, would be lost. Thank I, you. I don't want to. We'll Thank you. Very important. You had your, your hand up, sis. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, well, we I'm can. Here. So I've briefly been in publishing. This is just to answer your question about who owns presses, how do we get work out. Uh -huh. It's not that easy to get into a printing press. There's about maybe five that could print a novel on that scale, all owned by Afrikaans people, specifically based in Cape Town. So when you ask the question like that, you're basically saying, please can you guys give us access to publish this work that we think is unimportant for you and for black women. I'm saying if you're sitting with a copy of a book and you're the only person who has it and you're saying yeah. black women must read it, scan it, send the Dropbox link around, we'll deal with the publishing later. Alright, thank Okay, you are the very last. Uh, but I thought you were saying something. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so basically, the one thing that's come out from this is that knowledge is, is something that is always going to be there. But then, from a science background, it then asked me, what about other black scientists? Where are their voices in curriculum? Because it's the one thing that we've also lost. And I'd love to, to, to create some sort of platform where not only from the humanities, in the sciences and law, there are our people that have created Thank you. Work. That's actually a question to all of us to explore to explore that in, 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 as, as we continue. Sisters and brothers, we have run out of time. Sis Kosi, your 30 seconds start now. <laughs> It's not a part in short, I just wanted to share the story that earlier this year I put together a proposal to republish Noni's columns from the Daily Dispatch in 1977 and the publisher said no, that's two old stuff and one stuff that's newer. So am I going to give up? No. Somebody's going to publish it sometime soon because I don't do it enough. of um, what needs to be done. Um, I teach very and bloody. I, you know, I've taught stuff up. The point is, though, okay, so let's get real. Like, oh. Here's the thing. It's all well and good to say, photocopy, we do that. Right? We've been doing that for years. It's all well and good to say, teach. We do that. Right? It's not enough. Right? And also, five black women with PhDs in, in literature and tenure in, in, in literature cannot teach every single black woman who's out of you all of the time, right? Unless we are going to teach black women as though we don't take them seriously, right? Unless we're going to go, oh, and this one, and this one, and this one, and, this one, and also teach the black women that we love who are writing now, that we are teaching now too, right? So it seems to me that this conversation is less about okay how do we start the starting yeah but it's also about okay well how do we amplify what else can we do what are we not doing that we're doing mm -hmm. right yeah maybe we need to do more of what we're doing i think people like barbara and me are stuff and we're going to continue doing what we're doing anyway right but i think that there is so when course he says people are saying well no it's about this all if you presented an the unfound lost manuscript of Alan Payton from the when was Alan Payton alive? People would say, what? We didn't know we did that, but they would find a way to publish it. Why? Because they think that somebody, they think that would be enough, they think something would make it worth publishing. How do we create for ourselves, for whoever, 
that that's something yes. that makes people realize that are you kidding me? We don't care if five people buy on each other, but we have to publish. That's the thing, and that Kosi can't do that on her own. She's doing the hard work. What else do we need to do? To end on the issue of publishing, um, Marion Clay is still alive, and actually, I feel conflicted. I do photocopy the books. And I know a, a lawyer, but don't tell him that. But this is, these are royalties that this woman deserves. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm not about taking livelihood out of someone's hands. Um, I, I, and and I, okay, I do photocopy. I'm conflicted about it. But if we prescribe these books, even just one province as a matric set work, you know, what are the children reading in matric? Um, my, you know, they, they, they read in Hamlet, fine. It's important, maybe. I don't know. But if we could, if we could have one province or one or two provinces making this the prescribed set work, um, there, there would be enough of a market for that book to actually be financially profitable. So I think it's about the willingness um, in, in our country for everybody to think differently about what has value. It's about what has value um, and what is considered valuable. Thank you. Wow. So much to say, so little time. Thank you so much for teaching us. It is up to all of us. We are a community. We can do these things. We've got another panel starting in 10 minutes. Panache wanted to say something to us. In terms of your tickets, please make sure you don't throw your tickets away. When you come back, that's going to be your, your, um, your entry. So we're going to mark it. So please don't throw your tickets away. And the second thing, just to note, um, uh, something that we wanted to speak about as a bunch of book festival, very importantly, African Flavor Books is here, um, and they've had trouble with these very publishers, these white-owned publishers in South Africa. Many of the books you might have wanted to have them here were not, they've had a lot of trouble um, bringing them here. And to speak about the realities of what it is to be um, black and published by white people. We can't continue to ask these white people to do things that they're not interested to do. Pumla, yesterday, her books were not sold because my publisher, well, the overall publisher, a white publisher, well, no, they, they haven't, they didn't bring the books. They bought too few, but we can go and talk about the details about demanding cash, blah, 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 all those kind of things, right? And I was asked in, in an interview, I think, the other day about which publishers have been difficult about letting books come to Abantu Book Festival. And I dismissed it because I said, you know, why am I surprised? I can't be surprised by the fact that they do these kind of things to black writers all the time. So the point being that the discussion here, we really need to talk about black publishers. We need to own the land that has the trees, that has the paper for our books. All of just noting that, that if your books are not here, most likely it is because many of these publishers are not interested. Some of them feel a bit uh, apologetic, so they'll, they'll overcompensate. But it's really important that we also note the fact that there's a reason why our books go out of print, because we don't own our, our publishing houses. Anyway, 10 minutes from now, we're starting the next panel with Lili Tlaibi, uh, Kaya Langa, and Malaika Waizanya. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you so much to our panelists for their generosity. Please, as you walk out, give them a round of applause. Pumla, Barbara, and Siskosi, thank you so much for teaching us.